Hey guys, we're down here in Lake Wales, Florida at Flight Fest South. We're having a great time. And right now we're here with Greg, LaShonda, and Mike from the United States Coast Guard. Thanks you guys for being with us. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. us. Now, you guys did an amazing flyby. You definitely got everyone's attention. The way you guys came in here was pretty yeah, impressive. Yeah. You yeah. held this perfect yeah. sidewards yeah. position while I think the flight mechanic was waving. That was yeah. perfect. Yeah. That was perfect, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was really good. But no, you guys did this beautiful pass here and you held that. That takes a lot of dexterity. It's not like flying an airplane where you're simply, you know, following trajectory and giving minor inputs. You're doing a lot at once, aren't you? It is. Even uh, just flying straight and level, you're flying with both hands and both feet. Today we were lucky because the winds are out of the north, and so it wasn't very difficult for us to kind of pivot that nose uh, into the wind and kind of slow it down for you guys so you can get some good good shots of us. Um, but we get a kick out of it. It's a lot of fun. We had plenty of power. We were nice and light. We had good winds. We had a good crowd, so it just made it perfect for us. One thing that really surprised me here, I'm used to pilots in command being on the left side. You guys are actually on the right side. It is on the right side. Our hoist is only on the right side of the helicopter. So normally the pilot in command position is on the right side because they'll be the ones doing the hoisting. So the pilots up front, we are responsible for the bulk of the safety of the mission, the navigating and the flying, getting everybody there safe, making a lot of the judgment calls that go on, whether we're doing a medevac or hoisting to a sailboat or picking up somebody that we found drifting in the water. Uh, we're just trying to keep a stable platform. If we're going to the back of one of our cutters, we're working with our flight mechanics to make sure we're over the grid, we're safe to come down. Um, so most of our work up front is the navigating and um, the efficiency of the flight. Now in between yes. you is this special gentleman, right? Oh yeah. Yep. Right, what do you do? I am the flight mechanic, also known as the hoist operator. So I'm sitting in between both pilots, cabin management, I'm backing up all the gauges, making sure everything's doing what it's supposed to be doing. If I see anything out of the ordinary, I point it out to the pilots right away. And uh, if it comes down to where we have to do a case, then my job is to bring it up as a crew, what we all feel we should do to pick up the survivors safely and finish the mission. And he's really being quite humble. Uh, when he sends down that hoist cable, we've sometimes got our own family, our rescue swimmer on it, so he's in charge of managing our swimmer down to a boat that's pitching and rolling or down to the water that could have other hazards in it. He's responsible for picking up a survivor that's in a litter, getting them off the cruise ship without banging any, anything yeah. or, or putting them in further danger. So Last what week. he does, uh, literally he has folks lives in his hands and uh, a lot of work and concentration goes into that. And it's just working together. Um, we just have to all be connected. As she's flying, she's maintaining controls, looking at her references. And my job is to tell her, this is what I need you to do. This is what I need you to position the helicopter so I can do everything safely. Uh, make sure that people, when I'm picking them up, they're just not swinging back and forth. We have to be all connected so everything works in unison. Amazing. Amazing. Now, you guys mentioned a swimmer. You have somebody in the crew whose job is just to jump into the water. And yes, and uh, Greg is giving the presentation right now. He is the, the rescue swimmer that we have with us today. He's the EMT that flies with us. He is, jumps out of the helicopter on some situations. I lower him down on the, on the hoist cable and he assesses the survivors and he tells me what he needs for me to bring them back up. If you guys can picture this, and I can't even fathom what you're doing, we always wait for the best, nicest weather to, to go out and to have fun and to fly. You guys don't get that luxury, because generally the person you throw in the swimmer in, it could be a storm. It could be really nasty weather. It could be a capsized ship with debris and stuff like that. You guys have to go into the worst of the worst weather, lower someone down into the water, hold your position over that person, and then rescue them and pluck them out. Absolutely. If we could have days like today, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'd have one of the easiest jobs. Uh, it's so it's such a fun aircraft to fly anyway, especially on days like this, but normally a lot of the cases we get are in the middle of the night. It's dark, there's not a lot of moon illumination, maybe there's precipitation, you know, isolated cells of weather that we're trying to navigate ourselves around. Uh, there's just a lot uh, more at stake when you're in those kind of conditions. Do you mind me asking, what got you into flight? What made you choose this career? You know, um, I met a woman, an African American woman, a pilot. I'd never seen a woman fly before. I'd never seen an African American person flying ever. And I was an adult. I was uh, 18 or 19 when I met her. And so, and she was in the Coast Guard. She flies C 130s. Her name, uh, she's Lieutenant Commander Janine Menzi right now. And uh, I just happened to cross paths with her. And I never thought about flying ever. It was never on my radar. <laughs> I'd never looked at a plane. and. I didn't want to do that, but I saw her and I was like, man, I didn't even know girls did this kind of stuff. This is so cool. Let me give it a shot. And so it's worked out. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. How many years did you spend getting training? 
I spent about two years in flight school. I broke my ankle playing basketball oh because, my. you know, I'm pretty good on the court and all. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it would have been a year and a half, but I spent about two years in uh, Navy flight training in Pensacola. Uh, some Air Force, Coast Guard, Navy, Marine Corps, we all go to flight school together in Pensacola. We study together, fly together. Uh, we all start off flying fixed wing aircraft first, so Cessna 152s, 172s, onto T-34s and other flying T-6 airplanes. And then once you're in advanced training, you'll either fly helicopters or jets. So there are some dreams or things that pop in our minds. and. You know, we dismiss it because we think maybe it's not possible for us. And and I've just been a big proponent of just trying everything that I can. It hasn't all worked out, and some things have been a great success. Um, but only because I, you know, had the courage or exploration or curiosity to kind of step out there and give it a shot. Um, and everything's not going to be easy. There will be challenges, but at the end of the day, everything I've done has been so worth it. Amazing. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, let's talk about your helicopter here. Oh, Mike's got this. Yeah. <laughs> My actual career is an aviation maintenance technician so when I'm on the hangar deck I have many things to do I could come into work one day and start working on an engine I mean rotor head or I can possibly repair painting stuff like that when I'm flying part of my flying duties is all mostly cabin management and backing up the pilots in the front in the nose compartment they actually have a radar we have a FLIR camera that you can see underneath the nose and with the FLIR, I, I'm also the operator, which I work from this console here. And uh, it's an infrared camera. If we need to search for a person in the middle of the night with little to no visibility in the middle of the ocean, and it's just a person in the water, it has infrared capability, so we can actually spot the person in, in the darkness. So your job is to kind of find them, monitor them, position them and to, to get them in here safely. Right. Hey, right now we got to think about this. Not only bad weather, but you're standing up and you're you're pretty close. You're a tall guy. You're <laughs> yeah. pretty close to the uh, rotor head here. Right. What's that force do to you while you're working? And believe it or not, uh, you don't really feel it that much and you have so much adrenaline going through you. Uh, first, you're hanging on the side of a helicopter with just a belt around you. <laughs> Uh, and, and you're just so focused on what the mission is, uh, what we need to do to rescue these people. And that's all you really think about. That I've gotten hurt so, multiple times where I don't feel anything at the moment. And it's not until we land and I finally get a bathroom break and I get to decompress that I, my thumb will start hurting and I'll, and I'll take off my glove and I'm bleeding. Uh, you know, things like that. It's just the adrenaline that just kicks in and takes over. This is amazing. You're not only able to work on helicopters, but also save people's lives at the same time. Now, LaShonda, I want to join you in the pilot seat to see what it's like to fly one of these in the rescue mission. Normally, you're sitting right here, and yeah. you're looking over your shoulder down through the glass, and you can see the person yeah. here. So normally, when we're coming into uh, our normal sight picture, especially to the back of a boat, so I've got this whole windscreen and my chin bubble. Now, as I move in over that area, I may start to lose um, visual with it but that's okay because my flight mechanic he's leaning outside of that door and he's telling me where he needs me to stop I don't need yeah. to see it I just need to listen to him and hold when he says hold and whatever I see at that time I need to like freeze it in yeah. my mind like do not pass where this rope crosses this part on the ship or something and so I just kind of hold it there and once I know where that that position is I scan it, I'm looking at that, I look at the horizon, I look at my instrument's power. I look out, I look, and it's like a continuous, if I find myself kind of fixating, then I'm like snap out, you know, then I get get back on my scan again. On takeoff and on landing, you're flying with both hands, both feet, hand on the side click, on the collective here, left hand, and then you're um, controlling your yaw with um, both of the pedals. Once you're airborne, you're flying straight and level, especially over long distances. I could put in this airport direct to Oklahoma Airport, hit direct to and I can hit nav where it navs the aircraft on that track because it's fully coupled to our flight director system which are operated um, through these panels here and it can fly itself there. Okay. What I can also do is I can arm approach or T-hub um, and I can make the helicopter bring itself into a hover oh, wow. so once we get through 100 feet it'll start slowing itself back 
it'll level off at 50 feet, it'll come into a hover. There's a button here on the collective called the hover beep. Every time we hit this, and we've got this on both collectives, every time you hit it down once, the aircraft comes down three feet. So really, if I wanted to be as hands-off as possible, I could nab myself up, I could hit approach, I could arm T-hub, it could bring itself down to 50 feet, I could beat myself all the way down to the ground if I needed to. Wow. I could um, control my lateral guidance over the runway if I'm getting pushed by the winds with a couple buttons on my cyclic here. So, um, said all that to say, you don't have to be hands-on yeah. all the time. Nothing will happen if I take my hands off for a few seconds. It's not prudent of pilots to, to do that, so you don't want to get in a habit of it. But that's the fun thing. I think that's why a lot of pilots choose to go rotary, because it's so engaging yeah. and it's so fun. And so flying out here, we, we, we pass like cow pastures and we see really cool homes and really cool lakes. And so we like to be a part of yes. the flying all the time. When you're on a rescue mission and you're doing that, yep. do you use technology to help you stay stable or do you have Absolutely. to? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So we have a button here called Hove Aug or Hover Augmentation. So say where it's a bad weather condition, say the clouds are at 100 feet, there's rain, it's dark, no illumination because it's so cloudy out. We have a, an approach called computer-aided approach to a controlled hover. It's pretty much called a catch. So it'll bring you down from altitude through the clouds once to 100 feet, T-Hub will capture, and it'll bring you down to 50 feet. So now you're under the clouds, you're at 50 feet, saying, okay, now I'm visual, you know, you're looking out, you see the person you're looking for, you start, you can slew yourself over to that direction on T-Hub. Once you get close to that person and you say, hey, I wanna come down from 50 feet to 20 feet to get better visuals or to pick them up or to come behind the boat, you can do that. Now, if it's just a tough night with the winds and everything, you can absolutely go up hub -off. Once you have that, the helicopter will not move from that altitude at all. It will keep your altitude, which is great because there's so, like, like I said, both hands, both feet, you've got radios, yeah. you've got winds, you're trying to maintain your reference, you've got night vision goggles yeah. on, like, if you can take out one part of that so you can focus on looking at the survivor, looking at the boat, yeah. getting the basket down, <laughs> because once the flight mechanic says, easy forward right, easy forward right, hold, he's telling me to hold because that's the perfect position. He needs to get that basket down safely without snagging it on the way up or on the way down. Now, if I take my eyes off of that position for too long, then I may start drifting left or right. Right? Or if I start to climb or descend, that won't be good. Um, so we do use technology. Most of that will be here on this panel, uh, coupled to our flight director. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, and anytime you can remove one element that you have to monitor, oh, yeah. you're putting your focus on what matters, and that's saving a life or, or saving your pilots and, and your, your crew members' lives. So that, that's beautiful. You have to have absolute trust in whoever you're working with at all times. Everyone is trained to the same standards, so that way when they get together, because you guys aren't always with the same crew, nope. she can rely on someone tapping her on the shoulder. She can have that trust element there that you know that person's acting in the best interest. That's a life skill that I think anyone can always benefit from is to build a relationship that's strong enough to trust somebody uh, for a bigger purpose. And uh, my heart's desire is that you never have to witness how awesome these people are in person because that means most likely you're getting poked out of the water somewhere or you're in dire need. Vashanda, thank you so much for the no, opportunity. No, absolutely. This, this has been great. incredible. Uh, friends, thank you for being part of the Flight Test family as well and maybe someday be inspired to do what these amazing individuals do themselves. We'll see you next time.